joint task force to investigate security threats. Vote of no confidence preparations begin. Landowners close and reopen port after talks. This is National MTV News with Mirba Tolo. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Thursday's news. The National Security Advisory Council today announced that a National Joint Security Task Force comprising police and defense will be in place to investigate any threat to national security. This follows calls by certain groups issuing threats to disrupt services and calling for public servants to join a stop work this week. Chief Secretary Isaac Lupari said any threats to disrupt essential services and stir civil unrest will be taken seriously by the Joint Security Task Force. Present at the announcement were heads of the government departments, police and the defence force. The Chief Secretary said threats invoked by public servants, politicians and the general public on social media are national security concerns. The threats have been to public properties, public safety, also disruption to uh, essential services like water supply, power supply. But those freedoms that we have are qualified rights and freedoms. As long as we operate, express those freedoms and rights within the rule of law. Police Commissioner Gary Baki announced that the police and defense force will work together to investigate threats. He said all threats to national security will be taken seriously and perpetrators will be arrested and charged. We are not uh, vindictive in anyone and I think the message has been given by the Chief Secretary is very clear. If you, uh, if you break the law, then you will be dealt with by the law. PNG Defence Force Commander Gilbert Torpo said the PNGDF was ready to assist police in anything they needed. Uh, it is our desire that you know, uh, people of Papua New Guinea, our citizens, the international community, including our investors, conduct the activities without being interrupted, without being interfered with. So uh, in support of uh, the police, we will provide manpower and any other resources that is required to carry out uh, this internal security task force responsibility. Meanwhile, the media has also been warned not to misreport issues that may cause civil unrest. When questioned on where the fine line is between freedom of speech and threatening national security, Lupari responded saying it is when you don't act within the rule of law. Every, every one of us basically said that you know, no one's stopping you from exercising your rights and freedom of speech in this country. But you have to do it within a confinement of our laws. You can't take the law into end because the Constitution provides you that liberty. What about my liberty and liberty of others? You have to respect. And if you don't respect those liberties and rights of others, then you are abusing. You are going beyond the boundaries of those laws. That becomes unlawful. Adelaide Xerox, Kari National, MTV News. The opposition has issued a strong warning to all parties that proper procedures pertaining to the vote of no confidence must be adhered to or criminal procedures will be brought against the parties, including the Speaker, for breaching the recent court order. Opposition leader Don Paulier says he expects nothing less than an introduction of the vote, an adjournment of Parliament and a vote within seven days. As the hours count down to the expected vote of no confidence motion tomorrow, the opposition has issued a strong warning to all parties involved, and that includes the speaker and technical teams. At this afternoon's news conference, the opposition leader said he expects nothing less than an introduction of the vote, followed by a seven-day adjournment, and then the actual vote next week. We will expect the Speaker of Parliament, the Honourable Tiozirunok, <clears throat> to do just that, to announce the motion on the floor tomorrow, put it on parliamentary notice, and then adjourn to seven days. And uh, adjourn to seven days within which the members will be prepared to come on next Friday and debate it and vote on the motion of no confidence. As simple as that. 
But what's come to the fore in the last 36 hours is the legal interpretations of the orders issued by the court for the recall of parliament in order for the vote of no confidence to be tabled. What could happen, as indicated today, is that the Speaker could allow for a vote without a seven-day adjournment, and that, the opposition says, will be seen as a breach of the court order. The 121 members of parliament, they have a duty. They're obliged to look through that motion, <coughs> to <coughs> analyze the reasons there, uh, to think over it. Negotiations began with government coalition members three weeks ago, according to the opposition. Apart from press conferences and press statements, nearly everyone is tight-lipped about what could happen tomorrow. This afternoon, the Prime Minister released a statement calling for stability. He's also cited how political stability is beneficial to large-scale projects like the LNG. Over the last three days, various parties have come out to express support for Peter O'Neill's PNC-led government, including the People's Progress Party and the Enga governor, Sir Peter Ipatas. Scott Waide, National MTV News. Police Commissioner Gary Baki has advised that police will be out in full force for tomorrow's proposed vote of no confidence. He said for safety reasons, they will be situated in front of Parliament House. Baki pleaded to the public to keep calm tomorrow for the vote of no confidence. Uh, uh, the police is not there to actually dispel them from going into parliament, but we are there to protect uh, you know, public property and to ensure that anyone else that wanted to go and watch the, uh, as an observer in, in the uh, progress of what goes on in parliament is not uh, hindered in any way. So police operations will be out tomorrow. I don't want anyone to feel intimidated that, uh, you know, we, we uh, um, you know, we're hindering them or um, not allowing them to go into Parliament, but I want them to also know that uh, there are procedures and processes that needs to be followed in Parliament. And once you go past the ambit of the police to go inside, you're subject to the rules and regulations of what uh, entails in the Parliament. The reasons behind student protests should not be forgotten. This from Transparency International, who say that while the UPNG academic year is terminated, the students must be commended for raising serious issues of national concern, particularly issues surrounding the misuse of millions of public funds. Chairman of TIPNG, Lawrence Stevens, said the students pointed out the government's failure in recouping this money and bringing those responsible to justice by protesting. He said PNG is in denial, and in a state of denial, we have allowed students in their thousands to become victims. And New Guinea flights travelling out of Port Moresby today were cancelled again for the fourth day in a row. Domestic flights were hit the hardest, with most flights cancelled this morning, while international flights were delayed for several hours. Meanwhile, New Guinea released another statement saying that it was due to technical crewing issues and will be rescheduling flights to uplift affected passengers. CEO of New Guinea has apologised for the inconvenience caused and said due to crewing predicaments, some flights have had to be delayed. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more stories after these messages. Welcome back to National MTV News. A local landowner group of Rabaul Town has issued a threat to close down all port operations at the Rabaul Harbour. Yesterday afternoon, they forced the closure of all port operations, but reopened shortly after negotiations with the East New Britain Provincial Administration. The landowners are claiming 25% equity from the port operators, which was not given to them as demanded in an earlier petition. Edwin Fidelis reports from Kokopo. At around 2 p.m. yesterday, the Tuwalingan Tobebe Ratagul, the traditional landowners of Rabaul Town, fronted the gate and placed traditional spears as a sign of no entry and welded the gate shut. The PNG Ports Corporation, the East New Britain Port Services and others all came to a halt following the landowner's action. The police were called in to settle any hint of trouble, although there wasn't any. Passengers bound for Buka, Caving and Pomio were stranded. They did not close him because long. everything is not uh, in line according to the demand of the landowning group uh, represented by the ILG certificate. What was initially unraveled was a list of demands presented to the port operators in July last year. 
amongst their demands was the removal of shipwrecks along the harbour and a 25% share in the operation of the ports that includes landowners' participation. The demand was specifically given to the East New Britain Port Services, a locally owned shipping and stevedoring business, but that demand was not met and yesterday, after a year of waiting, the landowners decided to forcefully stop all work at the ports. The protest yesterday was intervened by East New Britain's provincial administrator, Wilson Matava, who negotiated with the landowners and allowed the port's operation to continue as usual. I talked to them and we removed all those uh, uh, the room or the spears that they put uh, as an act of uh, uh, their dissatisfaction on some things using the customary way. So I, I, I removed and we negotiated with them to remove all those spears and all those wolves uh, on the gates to the, the specific wolves. So um, now the, wolf, the PNC port is open again. It's open for, for use and the business will, as usual, again from this afternoon. Negotiations are continuing between the port operators, the provincial government and the landowners, and an agreement is yet to be reached. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. The Papua New Guinea Electoral Commission has warned against early campaigning for 2017, saying it is illegal. The public notice comes following numerous complaints received from members of the public concerning early campaigning by individuals intending to contest the 2017 elections. As the body set up under the Constitution to conduct free, fair and safe elections, the Electoral Commission is making sure that the public is aware of the offences relating to elections under the Criminal Code. From past experiences, election campaigns can come in the form of treating, undue influence and bribery. These actions can cop penalties of fines not exceeding 400 kina or imprisonment for a period not exceeding one year. If found guilty from the date of conviction, a person is incapable for a period of three years to vote and to stand for election. When announcing the 2017 National Election Program, Electoral Commissioner Patilius Gamato said the nomination period is seven days, from 20th to the 27th of April 2017, and the campaign period is eight weeks, from the 20th of April to the 8th of July 2017. The Electoral Commission said members of the public may lay complaints to the police to investigate, arrest and charge any person who may have committed any electoral offences, including early campaigning. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. The National Court will decide whether or not to drop misappropriation charges against Como Margarima MP Francis Potape next Tuesday. Today, his lawyer, Justin Hayara, presented a no-case submission after the retrial ended. Hayara argued that there was insufficient evidence for the court to convict Potape. Ayara told the court this afternoon that there are no hard evidences to prove the state's allegations. The state alleged that between the 1st and 30th of November 2010 in Mendi, Potape, the then chairman of the Como Magarima Joint District Planning and Budget Priority Committee, consented with members of the committee and dishonestly applied a sum of 330,000 kina as seating allowance. From the total, 60,000 kina was alleged to be paid to Potape and 270,000 kina was alleged to be paid to the committee members. Of the five state witnesses, Ayara told the court that two failed to prove the essential elements of the offense. One witness's evidence statements were only his opinion drawn from his audit investigation. Ayara concluded that the state's evidence is insufficient or incomplete, and as such, the charges cannot be sustained. However, the state submitted that there is still sufficient evidence and is circumstantial. Vasenata Yama, National MTV News. A verdict for the court case of businessman Eramas Wartoto will be handed down tomorrow by Justice George Manuhu of the Waigani National Court. A trial was conducted in February this year into the misuse of the Keravat National High School renovation funds in 2009. 
The state alleges that funds amounting to 7.9 million kina were paid to Sarakolok West Transport, a company which Wartoto headed as managing director in 2009. Felix Kange, the lawyer accused of murdering his wife, has asked the court to withdraw a second charge against him, the charge of escaping from lawful custody. Kange told the Waigani Committal Court it would be difficult for police to prove his escape. The application was made on the ground that the term prisoner does not apply to Kange. The argument centered around the use of the term prisoner. The court heard that under the Criminal Code Act, the charge escaping from lawful custody applies to a person who escapes from custody, regardless of whether he is a convict or an accused. Police alleged that Kange escaped from police custody while he was detained at the Waigani holding cells. In court yesterday, Kange's lawyer submitted that Kange was not a prisoner of the state but a detainee therefore asked the court to withdraw the charge. However, Magistrate Cosmas Bidar explained that the charge does not necessarily apply to a prisoner. 39-year-old Kange was accused of killing his wife, Regina Morove, on May 14th at their family home in Port Mosby. His application for bail was refused by the Waigani National Court because of the seriousness of the charge. He is detained at the Waigani holding cells. A decision on this submission will be handed down when the case returns to court on 11th August. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. Le Metropolitan Commander Chief Superintendent Anthony Wagambi says the Criminal Investigation Division records have shown a decline in major crimes this year. From the month of June to December last year, there were 616 criminal cases reported to Le CID. And from January this year to June, 476 serious cases were reported. That is a drop by 140 cases. The serious crimes include fraud and stealing, rape, robbery, murder, wounding, grievous bodily harm, abduction and stolen motor vehicles. Police were able to identify suspects in most of the cases and make arrests. This year, an average of seven out of every ten suspects have been arrested by police. A 70% arrest rate and a significant improvement. In addition, the reduction of crime in the city can also be attributed to the capture of many known suspects who have been involved in a string of armed robberies. In the last six months, lay personnel have done extremely well amid staff challenges. They have exercised restraint and control, especially during the Morobe Youth protest last year and the ongoing Unitech students' unrest situation. Lay is generally improving with good policing. Response time to incidences has improved. There is still a lot more work that needs to be done. But the lack of resources and manpower is getting in the way of police duties. The Metropolitan Command has made several recommendations to the Morobe Provincial Government and the Lay District. These recommendations are for the sector patrol to be implemented in Lay City. This concept, if implemented, will see Lay City divided into four patrol zones with each patrol unit. The Lay Metropolitan Commander Chief Superintendent Anthony Wagambi has indicated that the sector patrol unit will cost less than 500,000 kina. The new plan will become a deterrent to crimes and will avoid people falling victim to crimes being committed. Mata Luis, National and TV News, Lay. The Asian Development Bank's biannual economic report states that economic growth in PNG will reach 4.3% in 2016, slowing to 2.4% in 2017. The report was launched in Port Mosby today. Michelle Bird reports. At the launch of the report today, Christopher Edmonds, senior country economist for ADB's Pacific Department, looked at how PNG was faring as compared to its regional neighbours. Last year, actually, uh, for ADB, the Pacific growth was, was, a, was among the highest among global regions, again, driven by uh, strong growth in PNG. Uh, it even exceeded developing Asia's growth level. 
uh, but we're, we're, we're forecasting a significant slowdown in coming years. Although the medium-term outlook for P&G's economy plans for modest increases in revenue and expenditure until 2020, forward revenue projections may not be realistic without further fiscal consolidation. P&G is likely to miss its fiscal targets. The more important message from the presentation really was uh, the need to start addressing some of the fiscal challenges that the government has been facing. Um, and in that regard, there were a couple of points that we presented. First is to perhaps uh, try and close the gap between allocation uh, and expenditure. By that meaning, uh, what we allocate, we must ensure that it is properly planned and executed um, so that the resources are not kept idle uh, at incurring costs. It is reassuring for the PNG economy to have important institutions such as ADB to continue to support the country's economic growth through infrastructural development projects. Nevertheless, the main stakeholders have drawn attention to the soft economic growth to be expected in the near future and are demanding greater transparency and accountability from the PNG government. Michelle Bird, National MTV News. And now we'll look at the finance news. The Kina opened unchanged at 0.3160 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3085 US dollars, 0.4028 Australian dollars, 0.2749 Euro, and 31.78 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold, coffee, cocoa, and copra all close the day higher. Palm oil closed lower, while crude oil and copper closed the day higher. On the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed 24 points higher, the ASX is trading at 12 points higher, and the All Ordinary is traded 12 points higher. Still ahead on National MTV News, support for West Papua's inclusion in MSG grows, and the head of Exim Bank in America in PNG. Stay with us. Welcome back to National MTV News. The efforts by West Papuans to become a member of the Melanesian Spearhead Group received a boost today with strong support coming from Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. In a pro-Melanesian media statement published today, the veteran politician and founding father of the MSG said the leaders must approve the United Liberation Movement for West Papua's application for full membership to the MSG. This was made prior to the 23rd MSG Special Leaders Summit in Honiara today. Sir Michael said it is encouraging the progress already made in recognizing West Papuans at the MSG and called for consensus despite some complex and sensitive issues. These are obviously welcoming words from the founding father of the MSG towards the West Papuan struggle for recognition and independence. While there is recognition and push happening in the regional political scene, in Port Mosby, West Papuan refugees are asking for the same, but for more immediate, practical needs. This property in Hohola has become an informal refugee camp for West Papuans, one of several in Port Mosby. Most of the 53 inhabitants of this property have registered to become PNG citizens, something they look forward to. But they face a more immediate problem. They are being evicted. Following a dispute over the title of the property, a court order was issued last year for them to voluntarily vacate the premises. And now they live in fear of being evicted. I'm by me, by go. Suppose me plo, police come round, me plo, by me plo, by silly plo road. Or me plo, by still stop inside until government must pay me one plo half. Because there is no official residence for West Papuan refugees in Port Mosby, they have no choice but to squatter in illegal settlements. Hans may experience such an eviction once before. Government bin salem dosa go inside na round him house lo me plo kota demi chim lo round wara me first man. Then we know what way to move. Some of the family will go now build a uh, house long rainbow where drain this la hap now stop. Me one of the family, me move come, me stop one time all this la family lo here and me plus stop. So now I'm this la eviction order now come and me facing problem two plus times now. With the court order, 
They say they have a case against it, but they do not have the authority and the resources to defend themselves. We plus stop an initial immigration for an affair. How old is me plus a soldier? Me plus no got money to buy a lawyer too. Bill blue lawyer come 10,000, 20,000. Me plus no got money, how buy me? Life no me plus hard, how buy me plus kiss him this la money to buy him lawyer. Particular person where by Harim crying a heavy blow me plus UNHR. Na foreign affairs, a mall must come place clear, come forward na harim cry na heavy blow me plan. Because suppose the government no look savvy blow me plan, sali me plan gulo take country. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. Following MTV's inquiries with the Office of the Chief Migration Officer, Acting Deputy Chief Migration Officer Clarence Parisal said currently the East Awen relocation camp in the Western Province is the only recognized government allocated land for the West Papuan refugees to settle and receive basic services. He said the government will identify and allocate land for the settlement of the West Papuan refugees once they have been granted citizenship. Thousands of people took to the streets of Honiara to show support for the West Papuans to become a full member of the Melanesian Spearhead Group. With the observer status that the United Liberation Movement for West Papua has gained at the MSG, they are now pushing for full membership status. And this was supported by the public in Honiara, who came out in numbers to show the MSG leaders who are there for the 23rd Melanesian Spearhead Group Special Leaders Summit. Despite recent increased dealings by Papua New Guinea with China, there is still opportunity for America to be a part in growing PNG's economy. Fred Hoshberg, Chairman and President of Exim Bank of America, made these comments when speaking to MTV News today. Despite being in the country for only a few hours, Exim Bank Chairman Fred Hoshberg took time out from his hectic schedule to speak with MTV on a range of issues. Among these, increasing Exim's presence in PNG, particularly at a time when China's influence within the region is increasing. Well, I, the, that's why I'm here. <clears throat> we did this large project, as I mentioned, with ExxonMobil. Um, and that should be, uh, hopefully, that's a door opener. And that's not the beginning and end, but that's the beginning of more projects, either in the extractive industry sector or in other sectors. Whilst in the country, Hoshberg also visited the PNG LNG plant site outside Port Moresby, a project which until recently was the largest project Exim had financed. Um, We've been operating and uh, providing credit in Papua New Guinea since the 70s. Uh, most recently, the large project we worked on was the ExxonMobil project for LNG. So I wanted to see that project firsthand. It's one of the very largest we had, and at the time, it was the largest in the world we'd ever done. Hoshberg says despite the current global economic downturn, PNG still remains an ideal destination for further investment. Uh, there are opportunities in, in the airspace, in power. Uh, a large portion of the population does not have access to reliable power 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we can sell. Uh, the U.S. can sell and we, we would like to finance, whether it be power, could be medical, logistics. There are many opportunities here. Hoshberg departs the country for Australia this evening for the next leg of his tour of the Asia-Pacific region. A heads of agreement contract was signed today for the redevelopment of the Moitaka Wildlife Sanctuary in Port Moresby. The contract was awarded to Dynasty Development Limited of Rimbunan Hijau Group. The contract was awarded under a land swap arrangement where the value of the land will be given as consideration for the development of the sanctuary. The redevelopment of the Moitaka Sanctuary will include office accommodation and a staff home ownership scheme project of about 200 houses. The Moitaka Sanctuary is under the care of the Conservation and Environment Protection Authority. Managing Director Gunther Joku said the Heads of Agreement is consistent with the Authority's intention to redevelop the wildlife sanctuary. Residents of Kasawari Road in Leh will soon have access to a health centre. The health centre, which consists of five rooms, will be built along with staff housing. The infrastructure currently under construction is funded by a resident of the area, Sir Bob Sinclair. When completed, the health centre will play an important role. This has been a need for the people residing at Kaswari Road, especially women and children. 
we we can't wait to see our new construction of the health center coming up through Sir Bob Sinclair, who's also a resident of Ward 2 and a long time resident of Lay City. Um, Mrs. McClay, rep for the business houses to the Tutumang and myself took the initiative to approach him so we can partner and see this construction uh, coming up for a health center and a staff house. This health center consists of five rooms, including a dispensary. A staff house is also part of the construction plan. The construction is headed by lay builders with a team of 10 working against the rainy weather to finish the project on time. This new health center, including a staff house, is the first health service in the area. This will make it easy for young and old to access health services back in the community. Currently, residents are seeking medical treatment from other health centers in the city. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. The 2016 Waragira and Mask Festival began today in Kokopo. The four-day cultural festival was opened at 6 a.m. this morning with the traditional Kinavai. The festival is one of the major tourist attractions in East New Britain province that happens in July every year, attracting tourists from all over the world. The Kinavai dance is a colorful event, and to a larger extent, it relies on community participation to make it happen. Men, women and children from within Kokopo and other parts of East New Britain came as early as 5 in the morning to see this spectacular dance that happens once every year. The dancers that brought the Tumbuans from the sea this morning marks the start of the Warwargira and Mask Festival that will continue over the next three days at the Ralum Showground in Kokopo. Now me play start him now. I'm start lower wagira tete. I'm start now. Okay, tomorrow I'm also more wagira by go now. Also I'm all steering bay now. All the some some when I'm can I'm back come up now or tomorrow. The Warwagira and Mask Festival is a special cultural event in the East New Britain provincial events calendar that happens in July every year. It brings tourists from around the world, and today many more came. The four days festival that began in 1995 seeks to showcase some of PNG's unique form of arts and dances found only in the New Guinea Islands region. East New Britain has a long, rich history, and apart from the relics of the war and the volcanoes, those who will attend this festival will remember this cultural event. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. Trukai Sports is next, and Hunter's Justin Olam finally signs a two-year contract with Melbourne Storm. Stay tuned. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. SPPNG Hunters winger Justin Olam will be leaving for Melbourne next week, where he will spend about a week with the Melbourne Storm NRL team. He has signed a two-year deal with the NRL club. Olam will continue to play with the SP Hunters for the remainder of the season in the Interest Super Cup before joining the club in the summer for pre-season training. After Sunday's match, Olam will travel to Melbourne to meet Storm coach Craig Bellamy and the team. He's heading down to Melbourne after the game on Sunday, Monday, Sunday night. And uh, he's going to go through uh, and, and see the uh, welfare guys in Melbourne uh, and uh, Greg Bellamy and uh, have a look around in Melbourne, see uh, where he's going to be staying. Uh, when he goes down there, so he'll, he'll be back up here uh, on Thursday. Yeah. The humble winger says he's excited and is looking forward to the trip. Well, I was excited. I'm, I am excited, but I'm not like psyched up. I'm, I, am, I'm, I have peace and I'm patient and I'm calm because it's not at over. And yeah, it's just the beginning of something. So just go there and just observe and I'll come back. Olam debuted for the Hunters this year and has gone on to greater heights over a short period of time. To be honest, I, don't, I, I, I really don't believe it. I wasn't expecting such over. It's, it's my first year. And most of the players have been here for three weeks and uh, sorry, three years, and they've proven their like their skills and their space in the interest of the cup. But for me to get such opportunities, 
it's really a blessing to me and I take it with both hands. I appreciate it. With the outstanding performance of the SPPNG Hunters in the Queensland Idris Super Cup and the success in the test arena, this will see other players be given the opportunity to try their skills in the NRL. Elijah Lavette, National MTV Sports. State of Origin Game 3 ended on a high for the New South Wales Blues and in particular outgoing captain Paul Gallen as they managed to rule out a Maroons whitewash at the last minute. The Maroons looked set to register three straight wins after Darius Boyd's try placed the Queensland side in the lead, but that did not rule out the Blues out entirely. Michael Jennings hit back with a miraculous match winning try on the 79th minute, allowing for Gallen to add the final two points between the posts before the final whistle. Bad news, however, for Andrew Fifita, who faces a ban for grabbing Gavin Cooper by the neck, while Greg Inglis could be charged with a three to four game suspension with a shoulder charge to Josh Dogan. Port Moresby Rugby League has shortened its competition schedule from 14 rounds to seven due to the upcoming Under-20 Women's World Cup. Each team, both male and female, only have six rounds remaining before they go into the knockout matches in the lead-up to the finals. PRL Operations Manager Meke Maino said necessary adjustments had to be made for this season. Godwin Eki reports. The number of rounds have been cut down from 14 matches to seven each for both male and female. Each week, two teams will go on by, securing two points each for both male and female. At the end of the seventh week, all 14 affiliated clubs under PRL should complete their normal competition and all teams should go into knockout with the grand final to be staged on the last week of August before the season is closed for 2016. <laughs> Operations manager Meke Maino said the games have been moved forward due to the under-20 World Cup in November. The clubs and the delegates came together in a meeting to come up with a format to shorten the, shorten the 2016 season. Uh, the main reason being that uh, in September and October, the city will be preparing for the World Cup women under 20 games. For that reason, all the available fields must be vacated. For that reason, uh, Portmos Rugby League uh, doing its bit. Member for the Tigers. Teams currently leading in the men's competition is Hawks under 20 and A grade and in the women's team the Paga Panthers are leading the competition. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. To Rugby Union now and with the Export Rugby Championships fast approaching, provincial teams are wrapping up their selection processes as teams are to be submitted by early next week. The Port Moresby-based Boromas and Gai Gai squad is expected to be finalised following the Hiri Cup finals this weekend at the Sir John Gai Stadium. The extended squad consists of a blend of PNG Puk Puk's reps in the likes of Tisa Kautu, Manu Gais and Elipe Makini and Capital Rugby Union juniors who are vying for a jersey in the Capital's rep side. Once both teams have been finalised, the Boromars and Gai Gais could easily be top contenders for the Export Rugby Championship title. The experience within the team extends to a number of former rep players like Willie Rickus, Raymond Romulus, Paul Joseph and, of course, the Pangatana brothers, who will be the driving force in ensuring the Boromars and Gai Gai's return to their former glory. Uh, with, with our coaching staff as well, we brought in some old heads like Raymond Romulus is part of the uh, uh, coaching staff. We have Joe Kautu looking after the Gai Gai's and we have uh, the two brothers, uh, John Pangatana and Anthony uh, has the forwards coach for Boromas. And we also have John Larry assisting um, uh, Joe Kautu in the, in the Gai Gai's uh, coaching staff. So it's, it's, it's about bringing back the culture that, uh, you know, uh, Boromas and Gai Gai's are known for. While there is much excitement around the return of provincial rugby, there is also the urgency for many who have been a part of the Capital Rugby Union to debut for the Boromas and Gai Gai's. A lot of uh, juniors uh, uh, players that have uh, stepped up. Uh, we got uh, Jedi Katal from the Valley Hunters uh, coming into play as well as uh, Uni Patrick, uh, Foster, Jan Foster Maso from uh, Wanderers, who was part of the under 20 uh, Pupuk side of Fiji last year. He's uh, uh, done a transition from 
from position that he used to play, he was known as a lock. Now he's moved up to the front row, which is a position that uh, I guess uh, our rugby is, uh, you know, looking out for players uh, as uh, young as he is. So there are those are some of the uh, young guys that we're looking at for this weekend. The Gai Gai's first matchup is against the Daru Stingrays, who they fear as an opponent, while the Bormars take on the Barbarians, who are a mixture of Central, Oro and Milan Bay players. Uh, we are confident but insane, so you know we can't uh, go past uh, a team like the Stingrays. You know, we, we haven't forgotten that they beat the uh, Bormars uh, the last time uh, they met here in the old, at the old uh, Baba and Oro with a uh, uh, a lot of uh, must be base players also involved, you know, uh, but it's going to be a tight, tight match. Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. And True Guys Sports continues after the break. Don't go away. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. The Commonwealth Youth Games and Pacific Games gold medalist Tadius Katua will represent PNG at the Rio Olympics on the 5th to the 21st of August. Katua, aged 22, will compete in the lightweight category among boxers from Fiji, Jordan, Vanuatu and Zambia. With other 250 male boxers who are due to compete at the Games following a decision made by the Olympic Tripartite Commission. Katuwa was given a spot after five invitational places were awarded to countries for boxing competitions at the Rio 26 ga 2016 Games, a decision by the International Boxing Association. The 2016 Olympic Games will see professional boxers compete for the first time following a historic ruling passed unanimously by IBA's Extraordinary Congress. East New Britain Provincial Games kicked off yesterday in Rabaul. The Games brought together athletes from Pomio, Gazelle, Kokopo and Rabaul districts. The four districts will be battling against the Governor's Cup as well as competing to sell their best, send their best athletes to represent East New Britain at the upcoming PNG Games in Kimbe. The defending champions, Rabaul District, will be defending its title against its other three sister districts to retain the Governor's Cup. Pomio District has sent more than 300 athletes for the first time since the Games began six years ago. The finals will be played this weekend with a final list of athletes expected to be announced in the coming weeks. Trukai Sports ends on that note. Don't go anywhere. The weather details coming up after the break. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports. Taking a look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours, we begin in the southern region, Port Mosby. Cloudy periods, some showers expected in Daru and Kerma, some showers as well in Popandita. Fine weather in Alotau. To the Momasi region, cloudy periods in Lei and Wau, a few showers in Medang. Evening showers in Wewak, fine weather in Vanimore. To the New Guinea Islands region, a few showers in Lorengau, thundery showers in Kaviang, showers and rain in Kokopo and Rabaul, evening showers in Kimbe, thundery showers with rain in Buka. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, all the centres can expect showers with morning fog. To the forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours, but first there is a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern region and also Finchafen through Vitia Strait and Dampier Strait, CSE Islands to Long Island to west of southwest of waters of Manus, waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to KY Island to Kerma to Yul Island to Hood Point, Samurai Island and with waters of eastern and western Milan Bay Islands seas 2 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel, Finchafen, and with waters of New Island to East New Britain and Bougainville, seas 1 to 2 meters. Waters of Finchafen through Vitia Strait and Dampier Strait, CRC Island to Long Island, seas 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters west of Long Island to Medang, Bogia, Wiwak, Aitape, Vanimo, and Northern PNG Indonesian border, seas 0 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas 1 to 2.5 meters and waters of West New Britain, seas 1 to 3 meters.
and a look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas, Coral Sea and Solomon Seas. Seas rather rough with southeasterly winds at 20 to 25 knots with gusts. Bismarck Sea. Seas moderate to rough with southeasterly winds at 15 to 25 knots, reaching 34 knots at times. And the Pacific Ocean. Seas light to moderate with southeast to southerly winds at 10 to 20 knots. Before we go, recapping our top stories again. New Joint Task Force to investigate security threats. Vote of no confidence preparations begin. And landowners close and reopen port after talks. And that is National MTV News this Thursday. From the MTV News team, pleasant viewing and good night.